Thank you for joining us at Westside Community Church. You are listening to part six of Pastor John Clark's message series, Answering Life's Most Critical Questions. Let's join him now as he begins. All right, today we're going to talk about who am I and, and, uh, or, and, and who is God. I'm going to try to answer. I'm going to do a little recovery from last week to make sure we're all brought up to snuff. And, and, and then um, uh, I'm going to jump into the last part about who is God. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 16. Uh, verses 13 through 16, and, uh, and, and I just want you to see, same passage we used last week, I just want you to see a little nuance about this, and, and, and I'll make sense of it. So if you've got your Bibles, go there, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 16, it says this, uh, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And I told you last week, Jesus doesn't, isn't trying to do a popularity poll here. He, his self-esteem is not low. He is God. He doesn't need anybody to tell him who he is. But he's asking because he wants to know what have the disciples heard. And they say, Jesus, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. And others say still a Jeremiah or one of the prophets. That's a pretty cool group to be called with. You got some friends you know that you don't want anybody else to recognize you with. Jesus got some friends here who say, you're like those guys. Those are good guys. Now it goes on to verse 15. But what about you? Jesus says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Listen, when somebody asks you, do you know so-and-so, you, you have a choice on what you answer, right? When somebody says, do you know so-and-so, they're referring to somebody who's not present, you have a choice to say yes or no. Then you have a choice to tell them whether you know just their first name or their last name. Or you can tell them what you two have done before together or what you know about their past. It's a loaded question. Who do you say that I am? They have an opportunity to answer that. And Peter uh, answered and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Peter gave an answer that was right. And, and it was an answer that clarified who Jesus was. I wonder today... Do you know who God is? Have you ever met him? And if you have, do you still remember his name? Do you know who God is? Because if you're ever going to know who you are, you better know who God is. Okay, so to identify who I am, I got to know who God is. And so I'm going to answer that for you today. So let's bow our heads, close our eyes, let's pray, and then I'll jump into God's word. Father, you're amazing. Thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that you'll speak today. I pray that you will be the one who is glorified and lifted high. And God, when we leave here, uh, may, may we know we were in contact with the Holy God. I thank you for everybody present today. And most of all, God, I thank you for our mamas. I thank you for uh, the mamas who are still with us today. Uh, God, I pray for those of us who've lost our mamas, those of us who are struggling this morning because we're losing our mamas. For those who had a mama who didn't love them properly, God, may you be everything they need. Thank you, Jesus, for this beautiful day. And may you be glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's talk about this. I said last week, a gap exists between uh, what God has said about me and what I see in me. And this gap I was referring to was, was that we know what God wants us to be like. We know that God wants us uh, to be holy people. We know God wants us to live good lives, honest lives. We know God wants us to stay away from bad things. That's what God has said about me. And he says, I can do that. God's word said that I can be self-controlled. God's word says that I can love everybody. God's word says that I can even forgive my enemies. That's what God has said about me, but I know the real me, right? And we talked about the real me doesn't forgive everybody. The real me doesn't love everybody. The real me isn't self-controlled. I want to be this, but this is who I really am. And there's a gap, right? We talked about the gap that exists between the two. And most of us live right there. We live in the gap. Oh, we can pull it off, right? You, if you're like me, you can get a few days together. You might even got a few months, even a year or so, where you were really nailing it. You were everything God said you were. And then isn't it funny? One thing, one moment changes it all. It's amazing how we can just fall right back to being the real who we are. And, and I talked about this gap. I, uh, I, I want to explain it as best I can. And, and, and years ago, I, I read this book uh, by John Ortberg called The Life You've Always Wanted. And, and I want to read to you uh, from this book just a, a few paragraphs, if you don't mind. Um, uh, and, and, and truthfully, uh, I'd love to read to you from the actual book. Uh, and, 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 and there's actually words on the pages. The problem is I'm, I'm struggling with the need for bifocals. And so I, I can't. I actually, the other day, I, 
I got the book out and I look, looked down and I began to try to read and I thought, this is going to look funny on Sunday if I just do this thing. So what I had to do, I apologize, but I had to photocopy what I was going to read in larger print. I'm not that old, okay? But apparently my eyes are. But I want to read to you uh, from this book, and it's legitimately what's in there, um, the first chapter of the book. And, and tell me, listen carefully, I know I hate it when somebody reads to me, because you read a certain way, and I'm going to read a different way, but, but I want you to see if, if this identifies the gap, okay? Because John Ortberg writes specifically about it, and, and he's going to nail you before it's over, okay? So I'm just going to begin chapter 1, verse, uh, the, the very first word, John Ortberg says this, I am disappointed with myself. I like it when a man starts out and he's just honest right off the bat. I'm disappointed with myself. He said, I'm disappointed not so much with particular things I have done, but as I am with aspects of who I have become. See, there's the gap. It's not what I've done, it's just who I've become. He goes on to say, I have a nagging sense that all is not as it should be. Some of this disappointment is trivial. I, I wouldn't have minded getting a more... Uh, muscular physique. I, I can't do basic home repairs. So far, I haven't shown much financial wizardry. Some of this disappointment is neurotic. Sometimes I'm too concerned about what others think of me, even people I don't know. Some of this disappointment I know is worse than trivial. It's simply the sour fruit of self-absorption. I attend a high school reunion and can't choke back the desire to stand out by looking more attractive or boring or having more achievements and impressive accomplishments than my classmates. I speak to someone with whom I want to be charming and my words come out trivial and pedestrian. I am disappointed in my ordinariness. I wonder if the gap is not that, that our struggle is we know what God has said about us, but we know who we really are and some of the struggle is that we're just ordinary, we're like everybody else. And to be what God wants us to be, we'd have to be extraordinary. And who can pull that off for any length of time. He goes on to say, but some of this disappointment in myself runs deeper. When I look in on my children as they sleep at night, I think of the kind of father I want to be. I want to create moments of magic. I want, to, I want them to remember laughing until tears flow. I want to read to them and make the books come alive so they love to read. I, I want to have slow, sweet talks with them as they're getting ready to close their eyes. I want to sing to them and sing them awake in the morning, and I want to chase fireflies with them. Now, this is getting a little too mushy for me, but John Ortberg knows that the real market is the female, and if he can tap into her, he can get her to buy the book, and that's why he's being so mushy. Um, <laughs> And mom, that was for you today, because if you ever see me chasing fireflies, shoot me. Okay, so, <clears throat> just being fair. He says, I, I, I want to teach them to play tennis, have food fights, and, and, and hold and pray them uh, for them, and make them feel cherished. But, there's always a but, isn't he? He says, but, I look in on them as they sleep at night, and I remember how the day really went. I remember how they were trapped in a fight over checkers, and I walked out of the room because I didn't want to spend the energy needed to teach them how to resolve conflict. I re remember how my daughter spilled cherry punch at dinner, and I yelled at her about being careful, as if she had revealed some deep, dark character flaw. I yelled at her even though I spill things all the time, and no one yells at me. I yelled at her to tell the truth simply because I'm big and she's little, and I can get away with it. And then I saw that look of hurt and confusion in her eyes, and I knew there was a tiny wound on her heart that I had put there. I wished I could have taken those 60 seconds back. I remember how at night I didn't have slow, sweet talks, but merely rushed the children to bed so I could have more time to myself. I am disappointed in who I am. If you're depressed already, raise your hand. Just let me know if you're... <laughs> Okay, most, uh, it, it gets better, <laughs> I promise. If I haven't got you yet, I'll get you before it's over. John Ortberg's an amazing writer. I wanted to take credit for this, but I, I knew you read the book too. Okay, so let me read this last thing. He said, I'm disappointed that I still love God so little and sin so much. I always had the idea as a child that adults were pretty much the people they wanted to be, yet the truth is I'm embarrassingly sinful. I am capable of dismaying great amounts of jealousy if someone succeeds more visibly than I do. I'm disappointed at my capacity to be small and petty. I cannot pray for very long without my mind drifting into a fantasy of angry revenge over some past slight that I thought I'd long since forgiven or some grandiose achievement that I've not yet gotten. I can convince people I'm busy, 
and productive and yet waste large amounts of time watching television. There are just some of the disappointments I've shared with you. I have other ones, darker ones, that I'm not ready to commit to paper. The truth is, even to write these words is a little misleading because it makes me sound more sensitive to my fallenness than I really am. Sometimes, although I am aware of how far I fall short, it doesn't even bother me very much anymore. Whew. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Did you catch the gap, though? Doesn't that just nail who we are, though? I mean, I mean there's, there's this who, we, who God has said we can be and who I really am. But let me say this to you. I want to make sure that you lift your head, and I want to make sure you catch this. I know what the Bible says, and the Bible says that my identity is not found in what people say about me. My identity is not found in what I have done. My identity is found in what God has said about me and what God has done for me. And so even though we can identify with what Mr. Ortberg wrote, and even though we can identify with the flaws and mistakes in our life, I know who God made me to be. And so what we got to start doing is relentlessly protecting our identity in Christ. If Jesus said, I can be an overcomer, then I'm an overcomer. If Jesus said, I can be joyful, then I'm going to be joyful. If God said, I can be happy, then I'm going to be happy. If God said, then I can forgive, then I'm going to start forgiving people. If God said, I can love anyone and everyone, then I'm going to start loving anyone and everyone. Listen, what happens is, if we continue to allow ourselves to believe we're not going to get any better, then we're not going to get any better. But guess what? My God says... We can be better than who we are. I want to be that person, and we can be that person. I talked last week about the fact that that's mine. I'm going to take that. I'm going to own the fact that I can be who God says I can be. Now, listen, that's recovery of last week. I want you to know today, your identity in Christ is sealed. It is significant, and it is done for you. All you got to do is achieve it and have it. I, I, um, I want to make sure now today, in the time we have left, I talk about who God is. I want to make sure that you, you know who he is and that you could identify him in a crowd. I actually, um, this past week, had an interesting encounter. I was uh, flying to South Carolina with some of our staff members. We went down Tuesday to Thursday, and, uh, and, and we were heading out of Grand Rapids, and we were on our way to Washington, D.C. And, and the way we got our plane tickets was kind of piecemeal, and I got the very last roll of the plane, and I was sitting beside a gentleman by the name of Carl. I only found out his name was Carl because as men are, as you're waiting on a plane, you're uncomfortable. I, you know, men don't like to sit beside each other. And they make the smallest seats known to man. I don't know if the test person for the seat has no butt and no hips, but that's what, am I right? You ever fly in a plane? Am I, yes, praise Jesus, they don't know how. Listen, a lot of us got cans on us, okay? And we need more room, but they don't. So Carl and I got real comfortable with each other. And we're in the last role, and, and I, I'd asked him what his name was. I told him what my name was. And, and then I said to him, what do you do for a living? And he said, I'm a retired firefighter. Carl's probably in his late 60s. Had a grizzly face, beautiful white hair, and tough guy. I seen, a, I seen he had a tattoo on his forearm, and I asked him about the tattoo, and that was because of the, the firehouse he was from. All the guys had lost a, a, lost a few friends over the years, and they all got a tattoo one night. He told me about this, and... And as the conversation goes, you know what happens, right? I know what he does for a living. He doesn't know what I do for a living yet. And so then Carl says to me, so what do you do for a living? I know that what I say next is going to change our relationship from here on out. <laughs> so I said to Carl, I'm actually a preacher. And he says, oh, great. <laughs> he said, I've only flown twice in my life. And, and for two times in a row, I'm sitting by your kind of people. I said, what do you mean by that, Carl? And he goes, well, go ahead and give me your spiel. And I said, what? And he goes, I know you want to tell me that if the plane goes down in a fiery crash and I don't know God and I die, I go to hell. And I said, well, that sounds accurate to me. <laughs> he said, well, tell me the rest of the story. And I said, well, what do you know about the story? And he said, well, I imagine if I know God and we go down in a fiery wreck and I die, I go to heaven. I said, well, then there it is. He said, well, is there any more? And I said, no. I said, you're not ready to hear it. I said, so I'm not ready to give it. He goes, well, if you know something, you should tell me. And I said, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> See, now in this moment, I got the upper hand. He may be bigger and tougher than I am, but, you know, he's, he's put out fires. He's going to be in a fire if we don't <laughs> get this figured out. So, so I went back to reading. We, we kind of were chuckling back and forth. And he said, what are you doing right now? And I said, I'm actually praying 
that we do start to go down in a fiery crash. He said, why? And I said, because I just want to see where you end up. <laughs> so this is the greatest moment. The, praise God, you know, you can't ask for better moments. So just outside of Washington, D.C., they had thunderstorms on Tuesday. And as we were coming in, the, 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 the pilot came on the radio and said, we're going to encounter some uh, turbulence. Make sure your seatbelts are on. And so it had been about a half hour since I told Carl I was praying for, for us to go down a fiery crash. And, I, and my boys were with me. Dave, you were there. That plane shook real violently and then dropped really hard. I mean, real hard, like, like, it, like something fell off, right? Bam! And as it did, I knew this was my moment. I turned to Carl and I said, looks like the Lord's answer in my prayer. <laughs> Isn't that the best moment of life? <laughs> Carl was strangely ready to talk about Jesus. <laughs> get a clear. I, I, I want to I make sure you know who God is. If you've got to meet him, you want to know who he is, right? I, this, this is one of my favorite things. When, when I, and and I, here's the deal. For years, because now there's, there's nearly probably over a thousand adults and, and children who are here with us first service. The second service coming will have even more. So on a given Sunday at Westside, there's over 2,000 people here, okay? And I used to be able to remember all y'all's name, okay? Even your kids. And, and if there's 2,000 of us or more this Sunday alone, there's like five to 6,000 people that attend this church. I can't keep it all in this brain. You want to know why I lost hair? It's pushing the follicles out. <laughs> Too much information. So one of the things I like about life is these name tags. Hello, my name is... Because once you have one of those on, if I run into you and I haven't met you for a while, at least you've got a name tag. I'd be like, John, that's who you are. And, 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 and if I've never met you before, but i got to fake it like I do know who you are, the name tag helps, right? I, I want to talk today about who God is. And, and I want to make sure that you get it together. And, and, and we're going to put some name tags on God. So I, I need, um, Josh, you want to help me, buddy? Josh, when you come, Dave, you might as well come up. Uh, these are a couple guys on our staff. I, I want to I have them help me today. So just to clarify, as we're getting ready, uh, when, I, when I talk about who God is, I want to make sure that you know I'm not talking about the God of the world or the God of Oprah or the God of who you think I am. Uh, I, I'm going to talk to you about the God of the Bible, and, and I want to make sure you know who God is. And so if you run into him, you know who he is. Now I'm going to use some theological terms today. That's why I have Josh up here, and we're going to put uh, name tags on him representing God. You are only God for about five minutes. I know Carrie is glad that I'm clarifying this, but only for about five minutes. Now, a lot of you see Josh hangs out with me on Sundays. Josh is kind of like my good friend. We've been friends for 20-some years. Uh, but one of the reasons why I hang with Josh is that not only um, can he deadlift over 400 pounds, and he's a black bar belt in martial arts, he's also one of my prayer warriors. So if you try to do something to me, the best part about Josh is he will lift you over his head, throw you to the ground, and break something. But the good part is he can pray for your healing when it's done. <laughs> And so, just, just so you know who he is, all right? So you be gone for a moment, all right? Uh, and, and Dave's going to be my name tag assembly guy. But, but I want to make sure you know, I'm talking about the God of the Bible, and this is who he is. And, and, and as I go through these, if you want to respond, you're welcome to, okay? No problem, but, but I want to know when I run into God, then I know who he is. So let me run down this. The first one is, our God is one, and you need to know that. Our God is one. He is the one true God. There is no other God, and you need no other God than him. He is one. Secondly, you need to know that our God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, meaning simply that He is the Trinity. There is one God in three and three gods in one. We know that God the Father is the one who is our protector and our creator. God the Son is our Redeemer and our Savior. And God the Holy Spirit is our guide and our comforter. You need to know that. That's who God is. So if you run into Him, you need to know who He is. I want you to also know, and I, and I jotted these down. I want to make sure I get these in order for Dave. God is self-existent. Meaning that God is God all by himself. He does not need anyone or anything to clarify that he is God. He exists. He is here and he is real. Now listen, if I'm going to bore you this morning and in some way you've gotten distracted, I'm not apologizing because I'm talking to you about the God who saved my life. And I'm glad he self-exists and I needed a God who was there for me. I just want to make sure you know that this morning. I get a little wound up when I talk about God. I want to remind you that he is also transcendent. God is distinct. He is different from all of us. Now, I know these are big words. Some of you are going to try to write these down. Don't. Just get the tape. It's a lot easier to do. I would do the very same thing. He is the creator, and yet he stands apart from his creation. God is not everything, but God had created everything. You need to know that. He is, by all means, there. We, what are we on to? Eminent? 
God is eminent. I want to talk about it. He is close. When we say eminent, it means that God is close. He is near. He is present. He makes himself known, and he can be known to you. He never sleeps, nor does he slumber. He is always with you. You need to know that about God. Our God is immutable. Means he cannot be changed. He cannot be altered. He cannot be tampered with. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he never changes. That's who my God is. Aren't you glad we got a God like that? I want to go on that our God is eternal, which means he is unbound. No one can stop him. He is unrestrained by space and time. He has no expiration date. I like that about our eternal God. He will always be God because he's always been God. And there's no other God you need but him. Listen, I, I'm not giving you just my opinion. This is stated fact. There is historical record of who he is. God is infinite. You need to know that he's infinite. It means he's untouched. He's unhindered. He's unobstructed by boundaries. He is without equal because there is no comparison to my God. That's who he is. He is infinite. Our God is omnipresent. If you didn't know what that means, I'll give it to you. He fills all space at all times. He is everywhere at all times. But understand this, when he is fully here, he is also fully there. That's my God who is omnipresent, but he's also omniscient. And let me explain to you omniscient, meaning the science. It's the that God is all-knowing. Even before it happens, God knew it was going to happen. Some of you are saying, then why didn't he stop it? Because you're a fool. God is omniscient. He fully knows you. He knows the heartbeat in your chest, the cell structures within your veins. He knows the very hairs on your head. And some of you and me have made it easier on him to know that. But he's omniscient. He is omnipotent. I hope, I hope you're staying with me on this because I like talking about my God. He is omnipotent, which means all power Rest in him. Nothing is too difficult for him. He cannot fail, and he's never lost, and he never will. He's the greatest superhero to ever exist. That's my God. He's omnipotent. Let me go on. Don't get me going. He's incomprehensible. I like this one. Incomprehensible. Even though he can be known, no man can fully know him. He is too much for us to understand. He is before all things. He is in all things, and he is always going to be all things. He is, by the way, my everything. He's incomprehensible. Listen, we don't have enough time or space to describe who God is. I, I, could, I, could, I could continue to talk nonstop. We could put name tag after name tag on Josh, and we'd have nothing left, but we'd have more than enough God left to describe who he is. Listen, if you ever run into him, I want you to know who he is. Finally, let me give you one more. God is perfect. God is perfect. You, you, you try to look for perfection in life, Remember, we struggle with what God has said about us versus who we really are. You don't have to be perfect because he's perfect. He is just. He is righteous. He is honest. He is clear. He is perfect. There is nothing missing in God. God is everything you've ever needed. Listen, what I try to do today is help you understand who our God is. The God of the Bible. This morning, if you've come in here and by chance you've never met him today, this is not God. But God exists around us, and he's available to you today. Why would you let another moment go by and you not allow God to change your life? Because our God is a God who can do miracles, and he's never stopped and he never will until the end of time. This morning is your morning. God is here. You're here. Why don't you meet him? If you've forgotten what his name is, I've just told you a few of them. Call out on any of them. God, I need you to be eternal. God, I need you to be immutable. God, I need you to be perfect. God, I need you to be one for me. I need you to be a father for me today. Whatever you need, you can have. Because guess what? That's our God. Let's give these boys a round of applause for helping us. Thanks, gentlemen. What I want to do in closing, I just got a few minutes left. Let me do this. I want to explain to you that, that the Bible is where you need to start. If you don't know who God is, you need to start right here. The Bible was written by 40 different authors of varying ages and degrees and experiences. Of those 40 authors, they penned 66 books. They're all contained herein. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit supernaturally. His word is here. How do you get to know somebody? You ought to find out who they are by studying them, checking them out. That's God. Listen, the Bible is not about something to do but it's about someone to know. It's personal. It's a relationship. You ought to get to know who he is. He's someone to know, and he's in here, and he can be in here. Compared to all other gods, compared to all other gods that have ever uh, existed in creation throughout history, 
their gods, all these other gods that we hear about, um, are either infinite or personal. And let me explain this to you. They're either infinite, which means they're either all-powerful, unbounded without equal. That, that's their gods, or they're personal. They lived a life, and they lived on earth, and they had emotions and feelings like this. They're one or the other. They're not both. Greek mythology teaches us that they had infinite gods, powerful gods, full of power. The god of thunder, the god of war, the god of rain, the god of sun. They, they had gods that were powerful in Greek mythology. But they were infinite, but they were not personal gods. In Eastern religions, they teach that they have personal gods. Men who lived among them. There is Muhammad, there is Buddha, there is Allah. Their gods lived among them. They had emotions and feelings and relationships and friendships. Their gods walked among us and they said some good things and they were recorded. But their gods all died and they're still dead today. They were personal gods, but they were not infinite gods. I want to make sure you understand this because some of the struggle that we have today is we began to believe there may be other gods. There's not, and I'll end the debate today because here's the deal. What makes our God so amazing, and I love this about him, is that our God is both infinite and personal. Our God is personal. The Bible records, and over 100 authors record, that he was born to a virgin named Mary. He lived 33 years on earth. He had an earthly mother and father. He had a brother. He had a sister. He had relationships and friendships. He got angry. He was happy. He was sad. He was thrilled. He lived among us. He was a personal God. And one day he died on a cross for our sins. He was crucified for me. And for you, he died. He knows what death feels like. He was a personal God. But here's the key. And he's infinite because he's the only God to come back from the dead. He overcame the grave, yes, and death could not hold him. Let me finish with you. He has power in his infinite of power to be able to not only do that, but he ascended to heaven and he prepares a place for us and he promises us eternity. That's the infinite power of our God. He is both personal and infinite. I want to make sure you understand who I'm talking about today so you get it right. Andy, you need to come. Our God is Jesus. And when I say his name, some don't like it, but guess what? That's who he is. He is Jesus. And the best part about our God is he's coming back because you matter to him. I wish I had time to describe to you even more detail who our God is. But hopefully you've captured today. Who am I? How am I ever going to get from, from, from being uh, shifty and, and over there and unstable? How am I ever going to get from what I really am to what God has said about me? Is when I begin to believe who God is. When I begin to believe that God can do what His Word says He can do. It's when I believe that I am what He says I am. It's when I believe that I can do what he says I can do. It's when I really believe I can be what he says I can be. Of all the things I've described to you about who God is today, there's one that I didn't get to, but it's the most personal one about him because it touches my soul and it should touch yours too. It's that God is love. There's a lot of things I could need, a lot of things I want, Love is the one that covers it all. I, I got time. I'll tell this story real quick, Andy. Ernest Hemingway wrote in his book, The Capital of the World, a great story in, in, in the late 50s. Well, in Madrid, Spain, he told the story about a father who had a son named Paco. And they had lived together for years. Paco had gotten into his early 20s, and there was a falling out, as a father and son will often happen. And the, the father asked his son, Paco, to leave. And he told him as he walked to the door, don't ever come back here again. Paco slammed the door behind him, and for years, the father and the son never communicated. Finally, the father, so filled with grief and remorse, wanted to restore the relationship. And so he began to ask people, have you seen my son, Paco? Some had said he was over here, and others said he was over there. But the father's search unending for months on end. Finally, frustrated, he went to... Uh, the newspaper office he talked to a man there and he said I want to put out an ad I'm searching for my son the man explained how much money it would be it was everything the father had so he paid it he got a half page ad in the Madrid Spain newspaper on the very back and this is all the ad said dear Paco meet me tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. at the newspaper office all 
is forgiven, love your father. The father wasn't sure if it would work, but he knew the paper would distribute around the city and hopefully someone would see his son and he'd be there the next morning at 9 a.m. to know all is forgiven. Well, the father, restless that night, could hardly sleep, but that morning he rose, he got dressed, and as he rounded the corner on the sidewalk coming to the newspaper's office, to his shock and his surprise, standing outside the newspaper office, filling the street and even the sidewalk across, were some 600 men with the name Paco. All of which were doing what? In search of their father's love, and their father's forgiveness. Maybe that's my dad. Maybe it's me that will be reconciled and restored. Maybe I can be forgiven for what's happened. Maybe my father still loves me. 600 of them stood waiting to see if it was their dad. The father's son, Papa, was among the crowd. And he was forgiven and restored. Do you know the beauty about God's love for us folks is? That when he puts out an ad like he's doing right now for you, he isn't looking for a specific one of you. He's looking for every one of you. When God rounds the corner today and he sees us here all gathered outside the newspaper office, he's not looking for just one. He's looking for all of us. And he wants you to know that all is forgiven and your heavenly father loves you. Why would you step out of here today? Why would you walk away and not know the great I am? not know the one who loved you enough to die for you. Why would you let this slide by? Don't do it this morning. So what I'm going to ask is you bow your heads, close your eyes. Mama, you get praying. This is what you prayed for for a long time. Bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pray. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I won't make you stand. I won't make you come forward. But I'm talking to people this morning who've always wanted to be what God said they could be, but they're still who they've always been. Well, today that changes because you're responding to the ad that your Father loves you and all is forgiven. If you need that today, just raise your hand and say, John, would you pray for me? Anyone else? Thank you, my friend. Anyone else? Wow, there's a lot. Anyone else? Do, join the crowd. Anyone else? Praise the Lord for that this morning. Praise God. You can put your hands down. I'm going to pray, and as I pray, you pray something like what I'm praying, and then we're going to stand and we're going to worship the great I am and close this morning. But this is your prayer of forgiveness. This is your prayer of acceptance. Pray with me. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I'm coming home. Thank you that you still love me. And nothing that I've ever done will change that love. Thank you. All is forgiven. And I am accepted. And I am secure. And I am significant because you love me. Thank you this morning, Jesus. We worship you because you are the great I am. Let us give the Lord a round of applause this morning. Let's stand this morning. Would you stand with me? Mamas, we want to say one more time, happy Mother's Day. Be kind to your mama, but on the way out, and I want to sing the great I am. Can, can we step it up and jump just right in there? Let's just jump in. This is who our God is. If you didn't get it through the message and the rambling of the preacher, you'll get it in this last song. But let's sing together this morning. Because the great I am is our Jesus. Praise God, I'll see you next Sunday. Andy, would you lead us? Wanna be close, close to your side. Thank you for joining us at Westside Community Church. We hope to see you next Sunday at our 9 or 11 a.m. service.